What's up? What's up? What's up? Podcast World Chat Building back at you. Another episode. This life ain't for everybody. Thank you all so much for the humbling growth and support. We're so fired up with where the brand is going. Don't forget to check out our sister podcast, The Foul Life. And we have several more podcasts with different guests starting soon under the This Life Ain't For Everybody umbrella. Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by two Tennessee-based company. The first one is our everyday partner here at the podcast and the TV show, Lynchburg, Tennessee, the most American brand in the country, Jack Daniels. What they've done for me on many occasions to get me through the tough times, the happy times, the fun times, the duck camps, the turkey camps, the just summer camps, the lake, the houseboats, the pontoon boats. We rely on Jack Daniels. Enjoy it responsibly and make sure that you don't allow any underage drinking. Thank you, Jack Daniels, for believing in our brands. And today's episode of the podcast is also brought to you by our friends at Revival Nashville, Revival 615, helping musicians, giving them a platform every week, every Tuesday night in music. Music City, USA, Rob Snyder and his crew are allowing up and coming musicians, established musicians, singers, songwriters that have already broke. Some of them already have number one hits. A lot of them that came up in the revival have number one hits on your country music radio today, and they're selling out arenas. I can name them, but I'm going to allow this man to do it today. Our guest is the founder, the organizer, the owner, the main man of revival. He is also a very accredited musician songwriter himself with hits with Luke Combs. And we're going to get into a song that he just had the pleasure of writing with Luke and another one of our good friends here at the podcast, Mr. Brent Cobb. Rob Snyder, how are you, brother? I'm doing great, Chad, man. Thanks for having me on. Gave me something to look forward to for a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, I've always, I've crossed paths uh, with so many people that you run in the same circle as, and you know, whether it's Ben or Brent or Leith or whoever, it's always, it's always, man, you need to talk to Rob. And then, and then I finally got to uh, a couple of weeks ago and I'm, I'm so proud you're here too, man. How's everything going? Everything's good. Uh, got the, the wife and dog here. We got a baby on the way, mid August. So we're just, we're hunkered down and, you know, getting some stuff done around the house and we watch watching everything there is to watch on TV. I think we watched it all and just trying to eat healthy and uh, keep keep sane during this crazy time. Yeah, man, I am too. Where, um, where are you from originally? I'm Alabama. originally from well, Westchester, Pennsylvania. My parents oh. um, lived in Roswell, Georgia until I was like uh, four or five years old. My dad's originally from the Philly area and... Um, I guess I started talking with a little bit of a Southern accent and my dad said, that's it. We're going back to, uh, <laughs> brought, brought me back to Philly. So, uh, I grew up, uh, in Westchester or spring Delaware County, Springfield PA, and then, uh, moved to Westchester during high school and, uh, was there and I moved to Nashville. I'm 38. Now I moved to Nashville when I was uh, 30 years old. So you all the way up until you're 30, you're in that area of Pennsylvania though. Yeah, I was in Westchester for, I mean, I knew I wanted to move to Nashville when I was 25, I think, when I really started getting into the songwriting thing. And then uh, I kind of just talked about it for five years. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go. And I was a big fish in a small pond, got to open up for some people like Jamie Johnson, James Otto that were real big at the time. Never, I've never heard of either one of those. Yeah, right. But, <laughs> but you know, I just played like the local shows. I was the local guy, like you know, did a show in New Jersey, Philly, Delaware, Maryland, that kind of area. But, you know, nothing is going to come from that. You can come to Nashville and say you opened up for those people and their people will laugh at you here, you know, as an artist. So, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big music buff before you go any further. I'm a big music buff. And I, I, when I, when I think Pennsylvania, first off, my mom's from Steubenville, Ohio, and we, we grew up, you know, going to back there and going across the border into Pittsburgh and watching the pirates. And I have a big fascination with Philadelphia, with Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and the entire state, Harrisburg, um, been there several times for hunting shows. Um, but all I can think of music wise off the top of my head is survivor the band because they sang eye of the tiger and rocky's got his statue there and then and then fresh prince but give me an idea like how do you get inspired what's the music scene in philadelphia is there somebody i know there's got to be some big rock bands from from the area right um well uh, there there is okay so there's like the older ones you got hall and oats that were from oh, upper god the next oh, my god. um what was the band? The Hooters. Remember the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The Hooters were there. Um, wow. That's all making sense now, Rob. I had neighbors when I was growing up, the Johnny and Joey and Joe and Sharon were the dad, the Adrians. They were from Philadelphia and they're the ones that introduced my family to the Hooters, the music. 
It's all making you, sense now. And you have a, uh, you know, you have George Thorogood and the Delaware Destroyers and like all that kind of stuff. And then you have um, there's there's a lot uh, there's a there's a lot of people. I don't know. I don't. I'm not. I don't go back and be like, wow, look at the history of Pennsylvania. But there is a decent amount. Now, when you say Hall of Notes, like I'm talking like melodies and harmonies that ev- they don't have a bad song. Are you a fan of that type of music? Where are you? Do you get into that type of songwriting? Do you like the Daryl Hall and John Oates story of how that all went down and how they were like on the sidewalk one day and this girl, Sarah said something. And so, and then she smiled a little bit. So they go in and write this. Uh, I mean, I don't, I'm, I was never a huge fan of them, but I did get into the show that Daryl had called a uh, Daryl's house, which is yeah, pretty cool. Heck yeah. Yeah. I got, I got introduced to L King on that show. Okay. I didn't know who she was until I saw her in his house and she jammed on that show. And so I, and then my daughter, she's nine and she's loves her now. So she, uh, anyway, uh, so go on. So you're there, you got some inspiration, but you know, you're moving to Nashville. Are you, are you writing songs at this time or are you just kind of a cover band? Um, I, I actually kind of, I was in a band before called, uh, they were called paint on face and it was like, I know we talked about the other day, it was like suicidal tendencies uh, meet sublime. So it was like the reggae part of it was like very sublimey. And then the, the punk rock part was like suicidal tendencies meets Pantera kind of thing. And it just didn't have, and with like a red hot chili peppers, weird thing all over it. So we, uh, we kind of went our separate ways and I put the guitar down for a while. That was like up to, I was 19 years old. We did it for a few years. And then, um, I just started listening to, uh, at the time I was going to school, I went to Villanova university for the better part of eight years. And, uh, as a a doctor, yeah, yeah, exactly. As a side gig, I really just started to listen to the only music that was on at the time. There was this thing where it was called free FM, where they didn't have a lot of commercials on the radio stations in Philly. And one of the stations, 92, five was playing this song, um, it was the country station and I heard three wooden crosses for the first time. And it just like stopped me in my tracks completely. I recently just went through a thing where I lost a few friends and I just was like, you know what? I'm going to pick the guitar back up. How hard could it be? Three chords in the truth, that whole thing started writing songs. They were terrible. Played them for my parents. They, they were like, wow, they're great. Played them for my parents, friends. They said they were great. Played them for my parents, friends, friends. They said they were great. Went to Nashville, played them for the bluebird. They said I sucked. So so that's when I really, that was like 2008 where I really, really, I found, I was like, okay, I want to do this. So I just went back and I went and I just studied everything songwriting from like Merle Travis up to present day at the time, which was like Brooks and Dunn singing My Maria and stuff like that, you know, and, I, and, and Montgomery Gentry was like on the radio, that kind of stuff. So I was just studying, 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 still talking about moving to, um, to Nashville. And I just, it wasn't until something happened very personal in my life where uh, one of my two, two of my buddies, one of, one of them was really good friends, um, passed away in a car accident. And as a promise, I said, look, I'm definitely going to go to Nashville. I'm definitely going to go do my thing and I'm going to give it, you know, my best shot. And, um, that unfortunately happened, but it did spark a fire within me to go and chase the dream. So a guy that I didn't really know, but met a few months earlier was this kid from South Georgia, came up to my hometown, played a show. Turns out it was Brent Cobb. And uh, he invited me to come stay with him for a week, my first time in Nashville. So I, I did that. I recorded a song. I wrote about the thing and uh, about what happened and did a demo session. And I walked out of there higher than I've ever felt in my whole life. And I said, you know what, this is where I got to be. So I said, by the time I'm 30, and my birthday's March 28th, I'll be there. Showed up a couple days later, but I got there on April 1st. So on Facebook, I posted, I still have the post somewhere, but it was like, finally moved to Nashville. And I had like four or five hometown Rob's moving the Nashville shows, you know, and then like another year would go by and I'd still be there. And they're like, yeah, he's sitting at the bar with his elbows on the bar, you know, (laughs) but I I finally did it. So wait a minute. I just want to make sure I have this part of the story, right? You had went to Nashville to play at the Bluebird just on a, on a, like a little vacation trip to see how you would match up. You get booed off the stage per se, according to you. And then you go back. Is that when your dad didn't said, Hey, the Southern accent, you need to get back up here ASAP. 
<laughs> no, he did that uh, when I was a little kid. We were living in Roswell, Georgia. And okay, I was, you're in Georgia. Okay, I got you. Yeah, and, and I think I was just talking with an accent, and he was like, "No." So you you're at the Bluebird. I love that place. You get kind of you're just flustered because you know you you're a big fish in a small pond where you're from, and your songs are awesome. You get down to this place, and all of a sudden, but what what really intrigued me about what you said, and then you bring up Brent Cobb, is that Brent is of the mindset, and he's told me several times, "Oh, buddy, anybody can write a song," and and I've told people that I want to hit him when he says it, Rob, because they can't. Now they kind of have an idea, but there is a true science to this. And yeah. for you to say that you went back and went to work and studied it and dissected it and did like a forensic audit on songwriting. I think this is like the coolest part of it that you can set your mind to this. And then eight years later have number one hits on the biggest form of radio there is in the world right now. And quite arguably one of the biggest stars and Luke Combs and others. So, so right there. So you go back and you're studying. So give me an idea of how you studied. You just listen to a song or do you go back? Is there books on songwriting? Is there, is there stuff that, that, that like you mentioned three wooden crosses, does, do you sit down and like study that Randy Travis song and say, all right, who wrote it and how do they come up with the hook? What's, how does that all work? You definitely study who writes what. And once you find out, you know, cause like at first you're just thinking that like, say you hear, a uh, you know anybody like a, a, a Randy Hauser or a Brooks and Dunn song or anybody like that say you hear their songs the radio listener automatically thinks they wrote the song but this is when you were still buying I was still buying hard copy CDs so I'd go in and then I'd look at the writing credits and that was like the best thing so then I'd go in and say okay then I start googling like who wrote this song who wrote that song and then you start studying their records and then you even look at their records that they put out as artists and they're even better and and then you just you just kind of just go down that wormhole of study. And I was obsessed, man. I didn't have a plan B. I mean, my dad has a successful business in Philly called Metropolitan Flag and Banner. They do the stuff for the Eagles, Phillies. They do stuff all over the country. And, you know, as for him, he wants me to, you know, carry on the legacy. And meanwhile, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go write country songs in Nashville. And he's looking at me like, what the hell are you doing now? Now he gets it. But I, it was just my path where I really felt called to do it. I mean, I've always had a thing with music where, I mean, I remember watching this, this, the show that got me into music was a babysitter was babysitting me and I watched La Bamba. And when that plane went down, Richie Valens plane went down, I went home and I was crying. I was like six years old, seven years old. And I looked up my Encyclopedia Britannica, which was like before Google, like these little encyclopedia things. And I'm looking up who Buddy Holly was, who Waylon Jennings was, who, and I was not much of a student ever, but I'm studying and I'm just, you know, and then and then fast forward to like first grade, second grade. I'm getting in trouble because I'm on the back of the bus with the eighth graders singing Guns N' Roses songs. And I know every single lyric to every song. So it's just I had the music bug at a very early age. Man, you keep saying shit that's just going to keep taking us down rabbit holes, bro. Like I'm a, I'm an I'm an Axel and Slash and Duff and Steven Adler and Izzy and Dizzy and all the new guys and Matt Sorum and Gilby Clark like a huge groupie, man. All my dogs are named I got Axel's a black lab in Georgia. I got Duff, who's a yellow lab here. I have Slash, who's a black lab in Minnesota. And I have another dog being born in the next 60 days. It's going to be a black lab male, and he's going to be Izzy. So uh -huh. like, like Guns N' Roses, like I was, I went on the 93 Dustin Bones tour when I was out, of, right when I was a junior in high school. And, uh, just followed him from town to town, dude. So that, oh, that, so I've always said this, Rob, you said a few things, and I just want to get a couple questions out of the way before we keep the story going. When you talk about GNR, people will come to me and say the greatest hair band of all time is Motley Crue and Poison. And then you got Guns N' Roses. I'm like, stop. Guns N' Roses is not a hair band. They were on a different level of 80s rock when they come out in 86, 87 with Appetite and then Lies and then the B-sides of Lies with when they covered Mama Kin from Aerosmith and a couple other ones. Um, their songwriting in their, their, their way that they put songs together from from all of their experiences in life and how they painted that story with jungle and paradise city, the big hits. And then you go on that album and find ones that weren't necessarily hits, but like night train and the way they talk about liquor in that song or oh, my, yeah. Mich my Michelle. And then you move into the illusion albums and you have songs like locomotive and breakdown and coma. And you're sitting there going, this is like genius rock and roll. This is like even on a different, uh, it's almost like Zeppelin and queen, but like a, a level up for me, even from that. And I don't know no, if that's a version of it. Like it's, it's like, it's pure American rock and roll. You hear get in the ring. I was in like, yeah. fifth grade. 
And I wanted to run, I was playing football. I wanted to run through anyone I saw. Yeah, and it's just like the things that they said to the magazines and Circus Magazine and Bob Guccione Jr. and get in the ring. And I know every song and I get, and I think about it like growing up, like what that meant to me. And then I would go in and read the songs and see written by, by, you know, Bailey, they call, you know, Axel's name was Bailey or whatever. And then Saul Hudson. And I'm like, who are these guys are writing their own songs too. Right. Yeah. And, and you, you also said something along the lines that when you hear a song, you automatically think, Oh, Kenny Rogers wrote the gambler. And you know, now, you know, since Kenny's passed, you go back and do a little research, Johnny cash recorded it. He, uh, and then you watch the, the Willie Nelson outlaw, the American outlaw deal, which my favorite singer of all time in country music is Merle and, and Jamie Johnson is my all Jamie's my all time favorite. And I tell people that my favorite album of all time is that lonesome song song for song. So that he does um, George on my mind that night. And he tells a story about how Willie did that song because Willie's songwriting hero wrote George on my mind. Well, Jamie did that because he wanted to pay tribute to his songwriting hero singing his songwriting hero song. So he did right. George on my mind. That. So that whole thing about, songwriting and i've talked to brent about this and other guys and adam hood who's another buddy of yours who is a oh, yeah. freaking stud songwriting never ever in my life i'm 45 so i'm seven years older than you it never gets the credit unless you're in the circle i don't think the general public understands the power of the songwriter and like the dean dillons and the rob snyders and like you are a badass artist too but you also have hits that you didn't sing so right. that you it's just a weird th mindset to me that it's almost like you the songwriter is cool taking the back seat because it's like naturally given to them like you're not the guy singing it and nobody really cares about that songwriting piece, or at least that's the way I, I, I grew up thinking. Well, it's funny because uh, you said this life ain't for everybody, which is the slogan. It's it's a big thing in Nashville where in Loser's Bar, if you've ever been there in Midtown, oh. they have a big sign up there that says this life ain't for everybody. And that's kind of a tip of the hat to the people in the music industry, specifically the songwriters, because when you're a songwriter, your antenna is always up. Like I, you know, you're, you're, you're clocked in from the second you open your eyes till the wee hours of the morning when you, sh you know, you should have already been sleeping for hours. And if you get an idea, that's kind of God saying, Hey, here's something, write this down, hum a melody in your phone, save it, bring it into a writing room, write it by yourself. But here it is. And you don't know when the next one you're going to get. So it's like constantly, it's almost like, it's just a weird, I don't know the best analogy for it, but it's just, it's just, it's always there. You can't turn it off. If that makes any sense. You can't turn it off. And I'm looking for a picture right now and I want to show you and I'll keep, we'll keep talking while I look for it. But the first time I ever went in losers was in 2010 and I'm standing there watching the band, the house band. Yep. And I took a picture of that sign. And, yeah. and in my, in my, one of my places here, I have that sign and that font over yeah. a bar that I had a neon made out of. And then oh. I trade and then I trademarked it and registered it. And I was like, I'm as soon as I got it. So then I started this, this brand, this life ain't for everybody. And in, in Nashville, it's more along the lines of you move there, you get chewed up and spit out this honky tonk life. You drinking every night, you get into this scene. It can get you, it can get you in a hurry. And then it can just like literally kick you out of town and say, you're not good enough. Get out of here. Your dreams are smashed. You might be waiting tables at the local pub on Broadway. In sure. my instance, I was like, I don't want people to think like, my life is in, is hard. I'm a duck hunter. I wake up and go duck hunting and then I eat duck, right? Like anybody right. can do that. I'm saying that Rob Snyder's life might not be for you and my life might not be for you. But if you listen sure. to the stories of all these people, right? I think that that's the song in all of this is that everybody has a story. And, and, and I think that what you say of, you know, it's never turned off. I think that's the coolest thing that you get. A, I heard Garth say it one time, man, I'd be just roll over in my bed. And before the iPhone, I would write a note and I just lay it on my bedside table for it there in the morning. But I knew if I yeah. didn't write it down, then I would never, I would probably wouldn't have that same vision again after I get a night's sleep. So you also brought up, you also brought up two names in your, in your intro of opening for Jamie. I already told you about my feelings on the album. I think he is masterful. I think he is now I'm going to say some words that you might, and I want you to tell me if I'm wrong. I think yeah. he's genius in a way of, of putting songs together and delivering that song. I think his stage show and his band is genius. Um, and I think that right now in America, like this is like the time of Jamie Johnson's resurgence of 
where it's almost like the resurgence of the hunter and the provider and living off the land, you know, all these quarantine has taught people, you might not be able to get your meat in a store. And so I'm yeah. giving all, I'm giving all this deer meat and duck meat to these neighbors. Yeah. I'm almost looking at it like Stapleton hit Luke Combs is hitting Luke Combs plays farm aid. He's got his arm around Jamie. He's got his arm around Randy Hauser and Willie and, and Lucas Nelson. And boom, I'm like, this is like Jamie's time. Like all, maybe he was ahead of his time when he hit back then, but maybe like this is the time he can get up there and show like real country music is back. And I know that you're in Nashville and I know you write songs. So you have to be open-minded to the bro country and, and all of the country music that's out there. I have a certain opinion on bro country, but I also, yeah. I also, I'm not going to sit here and say, don't go make a living. So Jamie Johnson, is it his time to, to, to have a resurgence, to get an album out there and, and give the people what they want and, and, and show people that real country music is still out, is still alive? Man, I, I wish, I wish I could say I, 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 I he would do it, but I, I was one of those super fans at first where I've been hopeful for him to put out music forever. And like just seeing little blips on saving country music, like where he teases us with like a Christmas song that doesn't really do anything for me. I mean, after that lonesome song and then not to not follow it up, you know, it's just like, Oh man. I mean, what was the double album called? Guitar song. And it was good. And then he did the, and then he did the, uh, the tribute album to, um, which was great, which great. was great. Hank Cochran. Hank Cochran. Yeah. Sorry. Which was, which was phenomenal. But I mean, I've been itching for a new Jamie Johnson music forever. Me too. And it's just kind of like, there's, there's other guys that are out there doing the thing. Um, but you know, it's, he also did a thing where he was the biggest thing in, in country music. And then next song releases a song, you know, with curse words in it and, and, and kind of flipped his bird to, to, to country radio. And like, he didn't want to play the game. And I think that's awesome. It's the whole outlaw thing and all that, but you know, right when that happened, then all of a sudden, boom, cruise hits and bro country's born and, and it's everywhere. And the whole format's completely changed. And it's, fun, it's funny, Brent Cobway is saying that he goes, yeah, he had, he had, uh, in color out. And then he goes to the guys and says, we're going to, our next single is going to be about smoking weed in a Baptist parking lot and turning our back to Jesus and cocaine and a whore. And they're like, okay, Jamie, you know, like it's, it's true though. That's what he did. Right. But he was also a songwriter. People don't realize that. I mean, he wrote, uh, I think he wrote true, but what did he write? Uh, give it away, George wrote, Strait. Away, George Strait. And he, he also wrote, wrote one of the cheesy songs ever. Honky, Honky Tonk, Tonk. Honky Tonk. Yeah. You know, and and they laughed their way to the bank. I think Dallas Davidson and Randy Hauser was on that too. But I mean, it worked. It was a Trace Atkins huge smash, and it probably funded all three of their careers as as artists too, which is awesome. But it's just hard. I mean, everyone's been waiting on the country music Jesus to come back, and you know, it's just. It, I always thought that that was. I thought Jamie Johnson. There was no one cooler. I mean, I remember there was a show before I moved from Pennsylvania to nashville there was a show called nashville not the one that's like the soap opera that was on tv it was like a reality and it was like chuck wicks rachel bradshaw a bunch of up-and-comers jeff allen and jamie johnson was on there and he was awesome i mean people were sending him demo tapes and he was just out with a 44 just blasting demo tapes it was, it was so cool oh yeah i i, I want to see that I, it's called nashville it's called if you look up jamie johnson nashville the show or whatever it is you can see it got canceled after three episodes oh that's nice but it was good it was good <laughs> no, no, uh, i mean I, I hope jamie puts out i actually share uh, an office with channing wilson at uh, rca at, uh, right by studio a and jamie's room is upstairs so we i've seen him a few times there it's pretty cool I'm a big fan. And you also mentioned Brent Cobb. So talk to me about the science of songwriting and how you, you get a call from Brent Cobb. And when I was on the line with, um, Kyle Daniel the other day, mm -hmm. great songwriter, in my opinion, um, yeah. he says that he literally had no idea how to act when he got an opportunity to write with Brent Cobb. It was almost like he's in the room and he's like, is this really happening kind of deal? So I'm like, man, people really put Brent Cobb on a pedestal. When I listen to a Brent Cobb record, he, he has a really different songwriting approach. Is that safe to say? No, oh, absolutely. Is he, he one, is he one of your favorites? Oh, hundred percent. As, as a co-writer, one of my favorites as a, as a music fan, one of my favorites, because from front to back, it's like, there's, there's people that try to sound like other people. And then there's people where you put on a Brent Cobb song, you're like, that's Brent Cobb. You know, it's just his melody and his writing process is really cool. He'll kind of have not so much even an idea, but he's an explorer. Like he'll just go 
go all over, but he'll have a really cool groove and a melody. And I think nobody beats him in melodies. I, I just feel like his melody game is so strong and the way he turns phrases and makes certain words almost like a rapper that you wouldn't think you would rhyme certain the phonetics of, of different words with certain parts and just where his head's at. He's, he's definitely one of the best, like on all sides of all genres. He's definitely one of the best. What is the definition when it comes to songwriting of a melody? Oh, definition. I think, well, what is it? What part of the song is a melody? Melody is to me, it's, you know, it's just that part that, that gets in your head. It's just the part that, it, it stops your brain from thinking about anything else, you know, the outside world. And when you hear it, I mean, you can see it when, when thousands of people are in crowds, it's like the melody is what they're all singing along to. And it's just that part that gets, I think it's the part that stops everything else. It's the only noise that gets in when, when it, the melody's that good, it's like, that's the only thing that matters. So it's actually not a, a uh, mechanical part of the song, like the hook or the bridge or any of that. The melody is not termed like a part of the song. It's just kind of that feeling that the song gives you. I think it's definitely part of the song. It's a, it's a musical part. There'll be a lot of, especially with like pop country songs, there'll be like guitars will mimic the melody and they'll do like the same guitar lick kind of thing to what the, the main chorus melody is. But it's just, you know, it's just like da 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 and then, and then the guitar can go ba no 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 It's just the same thing. It's just... It's how you say the words. And, and and Brent gets so much emotion out. I mean, and he's got his his way of, th- of saying things. And I've noticed so many times where it's like, I've had to listen to a couple of songs a few times where I'm like, I don't even understand. In the first two records that he did, the vocal was kind of smushed a little bit. The ones he did with Dave Cobb, the band wasn't out as, the band was kind of more out in front than the lyric was. And it's hard to understand some of the stuff he said at some times, but thing about a Brent Cobb song is you, you don't even care what the hell he's saying. And it just, you feel it. If it's a sad song, you feel it. If it's a happy song, if it's a party song, if it's whatever song, there's so much emotion in there wrapped into what he's saying and how he's saying it, that it just, it blows me away. I mean, he, he's got a talent second to none for sure. It's so funny. Like I even get chills when I see you say it blows me away because I just, it's the exact same way his songs make me feel and mm-hmm. it's just so cool to hear somebody that writes with him say that because I've often wondered, like, when you listen to his new track and he says, you know, when he's you know, shooting stars out and he says that whole vibe right there about down the barrel of a gun and ricochet and office. And I'm like trying oh, to figure And it's like yeah. a Quentin Tarantino. It's like a Quentin Tarantino movie. And you got to like rewind and go, what the hell just happened? Like you never get it the first or second time. Brent. Yeah. Brent is, he's just. He's on another level. And, you know, it's tough and and for a guy that's that good and you listen to country radio and a lot of it is not rocket science. I mean, almost like you have to dumb down a lot of stuff to get to get the success that a lot of the songwriters are getting. And Brent, you know, we're talking to people that are a text message generation. You know, if you say a certain phrase or turn a phrase a certain way, these people don't. They want to know exactly what it is when you say it, when you say it. You know, it's just like. For to make them think, nobody wants to think a whole lot. But I mean, his I listened to um, his whole new record. You know that "Shut Up and oh, Sing." God, oh, genius! So good. I don't I mean, know if cl- I throw. I don't know if I throw around that term too much, Rob. And just tell me if I do because I don't want to. It's just that certain people hit me like that. And as the more I investigate people, like you said, the GNRs or the Jamies, and the way that you guys write songs, it's just there's a different level to this game, and it's yeah. just it's it's a. Uh, it's kind of, I don't know what I'm trying to say. It's just that when you hear that album of, and the way he puts words together, I, 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 I just go there. I just, I, I really think a lot, even when you said the vocal, Brent has told me that the vocals more out front now, as opposed like when you listen to yes. shine, when you listen to shine, you, there are words you miss. They're like, you got to go back and figure out or even read the lyric sheet to know what he's saying, even though the songwriting was still there, right? You agree that the songwriting was still there. Songwriting is to- It's always been there. I mean, I, I was hanging with uh, Lane Brent's wife uh, a few years back at a Super Bowl party, and we were just talking about the next record. And she looks at me, and he's like, "Songs? He doesn't need songs. He could he could make another eight records and never write a song again. He's got so many songs. And when you go to write a song with Brent Cobb, he's got a melody, he's got a verse, and part of a chorus. And he doesn't show up. He he he's not one of those guys where I'll just go in not have anything. I might have a flip through my phone and have a couple of titles." and stare at a stranger and try to make something last forever out of nothing. And 
you know, nine times out of 10, you get a, eh, it's, it's not the best. Like Brent comes in with something every time. And, and I don't know where he gets it, but I said like before the antenna's up, he must have a pretty damn big antenna. <laughs> he yeah, he's a- got to. And like in what you said, Rob, about dumbing it down, I, um, I'm thinking of the song. Okay. Cell phone generation texting girl on the back of a tailgate, hon- you know, the honky tonk, but donk donk, or, you know, shake it for me, country girl, all the hits that have like gotten big. And then Brent gets a cut on a Luke, a Luke Bryan album called tailgate blues. And when you listen to that tailgate song, I'm like, that's a tailgate song, right? But you got to break it down. And you're like, what are the trees saying? You're having a, a conversation with a Dixie cup and a cricket. Like what the, nobody understands that shit. Unless you like really have been in the country and understand what a real dirt road is. And not just this picture of this huge bonfire that, you know, one County's fist fight in the other County and all the chicks are like, I can see that happening. But what Brent painted that picture, I was like, that's my country. Like, that's how I grew up. And I'm not even from the South or Southeast. You could be from Pennsylvania right. and know what the hell that moonlight through. But anyway, is that kind of what you're saying when you hear that kind of tailgate song? It's not dumbed down enough for radio. Uh, well, it just never was a single. I know it went on to be, it was like a big song for him, but you know, it wasn't a single. Now, if you look the funny thing and Brent has joked with me before and he goes, man, I think I invented bro country because he put that song out there and it was like tailgates talking about crickets, everything. Next album, which Brent did not have a cut on on his on Luke Bryan's album, all the songwriters are writing songs about crickets and, and tailgates and everything. Exactly. Yeah. So That's then he then, then he did his Yo Bro song after that. I remember, remember that song he did mm. the kind of rap. I love song. it live. I love when he does it live. Yeah. So he good. doesn't do it often, but okay. I want to okay, Rob Snyder. Now I want to get into what you do because it's truly a freaking awesome story, dude. And congratulations on the success. And you just keep. Um, you just, I guess it's one of those things to where you get a little bit momentum and you, and you stay creative. You get opportunity is everything. If you get an opportunity, something big can happen. And I don't know if you can talk about what just happened, but let's, let's talk about what just happened in the last three weeks during the quarantine, the opportunity that you got. And you, I don't know how much we can talk about. I, I heard a rumor that it might be being released. I, it had, it had, four and a half million views in 24 hours on Luke Combs Facebook. Yeah, yeah. So you guys are quarantined. You get on a Facebook or a, or a FaceTime or a zoom call. You take it from there. Like you, it's you, Luke Combs and Brent Cobb, correct? Yeah. Um, well, I, I had, a basically I have a, just a, a title list in my phone that I keep in my iPhone notes. And like, obviously I knew that I was going to be writing with, um, with Luke and Brent and Brent and I spoke a few times uh, about a week and a half before we're already quarantined. And, you know, I talked to Brent about it and I was like, you know, I was, I was having a couple beers, FaceTime beers with a buddy last night. And he actually gave me the title. He was like, he's like, dude. And he gives me titles all the time. His name's Alan Sykes. He lives in Florida, big duck hunter. He's, he's high volume duck hunter, big time. <laughs> nice. And, uh, he, uh, he was like, Hey dude, you need to write uh, six feet apart. And he always gives me titles. I'm kind of like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to write that one down. And I, I pitched the idea to Brent Brent. And he was like, you think we should go there? And Brent had this little, you know, the melody of how the song started and the first two lines of the song. And, and I was like, man, I think if we have the ability to write the song, like you got to look at it like this, everyone's going to write the song. Everyone's going to write the quarantine blues one way or another. Um, People need music right now. They need hope. They need a lot of things. I was like, if we have the opportunity to do it with the biggest guy in country music and, you know, really get it out there and make some people feel good, let's do it. I think Luke's going to be a guy that wants to say it. And sure enough, the day before Luke sent us a text and he said, hey, guys, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking about what's going on. Do you think we should just go ahead and do it? And I was like, funny you say that. I got the title and Brent has a killer melody. And then next day we were off to the races. Done um, in two hours. What were the first two lines that Cobb had already? Um, when, the cri- when, uh, when the dog would start to bloom and the crickets hum their tune. Another cricket line. Yep. He's a cricket master. He really is. He's, <laughs> yeah. um, and then, uh, you know, from there it was just, we just started laundry list and everything, you know, it's like, you miss your parents. I mean, Luke's parents are away from him. Brent's away from his parents. My parents are quarantined in Florida right now. It's like, everybody misses everything. I was like, let's just talk about what we miss and, and give hope. And it just came together. I could not believe he played it the next day. 
Um, I almost fell over. I was sitting with my wife and my dog. I'm like, he's playing it right now. He's playing it right now. And then I'm getting calls that it's being ripped from YouTube and putting, and people are playing it on the actual radio stations. And then we find out a week later that he recorded it and it comes out uh, tomorrow, which is May 1st. And he also did it on Bobby Bones, the Opry deal, correct? Yes, did it on the Opry as well. So, so now let me ask you this. When you are sitting there and you hear it with your wife, are you like through the roof excited or are you like, holy shit, dude, it's, we're not even finished with it yet. There's still more to add to it. Or were you 100% legitimately done and you already put your stamp on it? No, we were, we were already, we were done. We knew okay. where, where it was going to go. Um, Luke has a very specific way of knowing how he wants to say certain things. And uh, it was just a great co-write. Co I wish I could say all of my FaceTime and Zoom writes have been that way, um, but I can't just because it's just a different dynamic. And it's, it's just one of those things where, uh, you know, we, we went in and we set a goal and achieved that goal. And then, with the platform that Luke has, it's, it's incredible. You know, he can just get it out there and all of a sudden it's, it's all over the world. It's, it's awesome. And you know, who knows, we don't know, nothing's been officially announced if it's going to go to radio. I mean, I have a feeling it's going to get legs of its own and you know, I'd love nothing more than for, for Brent to have um, some good uh, success and notoriety for, for being a part of that, that song and, you know, get him to the, the next level and get some accolades that he, he really deserves. Well, I'm glad you feel that way, but you also do too. And you are already part of that group that's received some. So give the audience an idea of this guy that has been in Nashville eight years after he got booed off the Bluebird Cafe stage and moved back to Pennsylvania. He's back here eight years. I don't, I didn't mean that you didn't move back there. You were just down there for a short trip to see how yep. it went, but give, give the listeners Rob Snyder an idea of some of your success in songwriting. Is there a song that somebody might have heard in a concert the last year or so or on the radio that Rob Snyder was a co-writer on? Um, my biggest one to date was She Got the Best of Me, which um, we wrote about almost six years ago in my apartment in Nashville with uh, Luke and Channing Wilson. And, you know, the ups and downs is like you think that you have them. At the time when Luke... Um, recorded that song. I was, we were kind of mad that he recorded it. We were like, Hey, we're trying to get this to Tyler Farr or Chase Rice. Why are you putting that out there? And then all of a sudden Luke just started blowing up and we're like, okay, okay. And then we get all excited because he's finally put, gets a major label record deal and then has the record. And then it's not on the record. So we're like, Oh, we're not, you know, zero chance of the radio. Then he does a deluxe record and it's all on God's hands. It's all, it's, it's out of your hands. And that's one, one of the things that I would tell any songwriter is like, once you're done with that song, there's nothing you're going to say to an artist. There's nothing you're going to say to a publisher. There's nothing you're going to say to a record label that's going to do that song any more justice. It's like you have to write the best song you can and then move on to the next one because it is a numbers game. I mean, never in my wildest dreams would I think that, you know, the day we wrote She Got the Best of Me, that five years later, it would be, you know, a four week billboard number one smash. Never. But that's just like, it's all the stars lining up. I mean, you can write the best song. I know a lot of great songwriters that write the best songs I ever heard and never had a song on the radio. It's just, it's just the perfect storm of everything happening that, that it takes. So that's if crazy. You're say man, that. If you're a betting man, I mean, it's not the best, it's not the best uh, business to be into for sure. Yeah. Cause I've heard Leith Lofton songs and I'm like, how is that song? I, I saw you bobbing your head to Leith Lofton one night on one oh, of your revival awesome. lives and he's doing one whiskey away or he's doing like, he's got so many good songs like that oh, aren't man. even on that new album. And it's just like, what does it freaking take? And now you're saying it's in God's hand. He's a man of God. He prays. Uh, right. Everything has to line up. The stars have to align. It just blows my mind that the business part of Nashville and the record executives and the people that make the calls, you know, like they'll hear a song and they're like, I just don't, I just don't hear that on the radio 40 or 50 times a week. And I'm like, well, when I play it in my backyard and I have 80 people at a Traeger event or 150 and they're like, where can I get this? Or I play it on the foul life on national TV. And they're just inundating us with emails. Like love that song wingman. Well, he wrote it with Bobby Pinson. Bobby Pinson has a lot of number one hits. How does that song not hit somewhere or get picked up as a cut? It just, it's just such a weird deal. Right. I mean, and that's, that's the other thing too. It's like, you have to be all in, you have to be present to win. If you want to hunt lines, you got to be where the lines are. And Leith has always been in town, but he's also, you know, didn't always have a publishing deal, had to go work 
as a Mr. Fix It, um, had to be like a land, you know, fixing land and had to just, he always is, he's a workhorse. And, you know, to my fault, I didn't have a plan B. And I'm not saying that Leaf had a plan B at all because he's worked his ass off. And, but like for me to a fault, I mean, I did a lot of my banking at um, Advanced Financial, Tennessee Quick Cash, uh, any of those stupid places, Title Max. I've done all the worst decisions you can make because I invested everything. And I was out in bars way more than I should have been. My first six years in Nashville, I mean, I'd be out, you know, six, seven nights a week because I thought that's where business would, would happen. But it started to realize a few years ago that nothing good happens in Nashville after about nine o'clock at night. And business wise, after five o'clock, nothing's happening. So, <laughs> you know, it's good to hang out with your buddies and all that stuff. But I mean, getting back to the why the thing, why Leaf hasn't had a big one. I mean, who knows? I mean, Willie Nelson didn't have to have a big one until I think he was like 40 some years old. And, you know, Leaf, Leaf is getting up there and not, I don't think he's, I'm not even sure how old he is. I know he's a couple he's years old. He's 40 right now. Yeah. And I mean, there's no reason, Leaf, Leaf will get his number called. And when he does, he has an arsenal of songs. It's just now it's a different game where the artists are not cutting outside songs. Near Once the streaming thing came through, People are not willing to go cut the outside songs. They want to be a part of the song. They want to be a writer on the song for whatever reason. And it's hard to go, you know, they would rather, sad part is, I believe they would rather put out a crappier, shittier song that they were a part of than, than a great song that they didn't write. Not all artists do this. There are artists that cut outside songs, but majority of today's want to be a writer on the song. So, when you talk like that, when you say that there are people that will cut a shitty song, are you content with what country music is doing right now? And being a songwriter and be, having to be politically correct when you talk, or I don't know how that I works, you know, I don't even know. I don't even know how that works. It doesn't seem to me like Channing Wilson would be like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to keep my mouth shut about bro country just in case I ever get a cut with FLG. I don't know. I, I don't know how all of that works, you know, as far as like, pissing people off you don't want to mess with the publisher that might pick the song up are you happy with the state of country music right now uh, am i happy with it overall i'm happy with the parts of it i'm happy with and i'm not going to uh, elude the question i'm happy with the fact that there's a couple girls just get, that just got number one songs for great songs for the first time and however it's a it's a dominated market you know where it's like male and I don't know. There's a lot of girls that I'm excited about coming up right now that I think are going to really bring it. Uh, Ashley who are, who, who are the two that you're re, you're re referring to? Sorry, Rob, I wasn't interrupting you. Uh, I think Ash. Uh, I think it was was it Mickey Gutkin or in, in, Ingrid Endress or something. Yeah. And another one. I'm not even familiar. I just saw that someone made an article. It was like two girls got number ones. But look at it. It's during a quarantine where there's a ton of people are not listening to the radio. Yeah. You know, which is weird. Um, the Cause rap because they're, they're not in their cars, or and they're just staying yeah. at home more. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I don't know. They said streaming numbers are down. It's it's crazy. I also feel like the I'm tired of like the boyfriend country. It's not bro country, but it's like boyfriend country. Like the the stuff that it should just be on pop radio. You know, it's like if the genre is the way I'm looking at it is if the genre is that wide that we can be so pop, then where are the country bands that sound like Clutch? You know, I'm ready to rock. Like. Put, put in some rock and roll. Yeah. Back Cadillac 3 was called Cadillac Black. I thought they were the toughest nails. I thought they were awesome. They are awesome. And, and then like, you know, Southern, all that stuff comes out and it's good and the spray paint. It's like, they. it feels like they're, they're kind of playing the, to the radio game a little bit for me. Oh, anyway. I mean, they they got the biggest guy in Nashville that, 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 in my opinion, destroyed the Spark album from Drake White that I think is an, a genius album. I th said that word yeah. again. It's an outstanding album, and it deserved way more than it got. And whatever happened with that label in that time, I think that that album was politically destroyed for one reason or the next. Don't know the business. No. Um, and I also think that that same label is pushing fake country music on people at the same time. They they have Hank Williams on, Jr. on a label and they have Reba on a label, I think. And then they're like pushing the fakest country music, in my opinion, known to man. And it's like, what message are you trying to send? Is it just all about the money? So it's got to be. It's just about the yeah. money and, and the and control. It, it, it really is. Uh, you know, I don't know half of what I think I know. And if you think you know something about the business, it's going to change the next day. All I know is like, I've drawn, I've drawn my line in the sands before with our whole Hank and Jesus are watching slogan and all that stuff. And I've said stuff 
you know, that got back to people that, you know, it probably shouldn't have. And it might have hurt my career. But I'm like, hey, if you're going to play Revival, I want you to play your best songs, not necessarily your number one hits. And I've gone out and said it publicly and it's hurt me. I'm sure it's hurt me. It's, it's got me out of rooms with certain artists. It's got people talking behind my back. It's did that. But you know what? I stand up for what I said. And I didn't move 13 hour drive away from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to write stupid songs. I didn't. Like, it's I, it's I so refreshing to hear that. I think that the song deserves more, and I think the listener deserves more, and I think that the whole mindset of we have to sell every ticket to an 18-year-old girl that's going to be bouncing in the front. The, the, those kids don't even watch the shows. They watch them through a four-inch screen, and that's who that's who we're mass-producing to, and there's no more Merle Lyric. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no more Waylon going on. And I'm not saying there isn't, because you guys are there. You're doing it, and it's not what's being heard. For digging holes not to be a smash of what it makes you feel like in life. You talk about a boyfriend song. You talk yeah. about a song that is written the right way to talk about a man that's admitting he's a piece of shit pretty much. And then he, yeah. all he ever does is dig holes. Like that's life. And you hear the second verse of rainy of, of shine on. And I'm like, how does that not become a smash? It's like, that's music to me. And, and, and I could go on and on. So, and I just get so frustrated that nobody will take a chance. If you're willing to take a chance on a guy that looks like Luke Combs, then take a chance on a guy that writes like Brent Cobb, because I'm not saying anything bad about Luke, but he's but, not your typical everyday fashion no. model, right? That a lot of these country stars are. And Luke Combs is a badass. I would love to freaking be able to say, I have a number one hit with Luke Combs because he's real country. He even said it on his new rate. His new album is called what, Rob? You say it. What you see is what you get. And that's exactly what you're saying with revival is that either that you live by that or you don't. And right. your, your, your songs and your cleverness and your wittiness and your, the way that you put words together or pull magic words out of the sky, like our, our boy Brent says, I just get so flustered that country music, like when George Strait and Jamie wrote kicked out of country over text messages, I'm like, yeah. they've really kicked the king of country music out of country music. And it's like the music, the music business is so hard for me to understand yeah. that, that you can just get pushed out. You mentioned another guy real quick and I'm gonna let you talk. And I know that I ramble, but I'm now I'm pissed. You're um, you mentioned Tyler Farr. He's coming on the podcast this afternoon. Oh, I'm a big Tyler. I'm a big, a big Tyler Farr fan. He's been on the podcast before. You were saying you wished he would have got the hit. Tyler For Tyler Farr at one time was delivering a good country song. Some good stuff, right? I mean, yeah. he, he said some things that made people go, oh man, he's like going redneck crazy and he's gonna he's pissed off. He's gonna get drunk and start a fight and domestic violence and all this shit. Like, I don't know if that was a little bit touchy, but it went number one. And then a guy walks into a bar and and now, you know, he kind of had a fall off. And the music industry did that. He, he fell off and nobody heard from him for a minute. And now he's back with L. Dean and he's got a new single that's that he's released with every truck in town. But is is that a story that is is just the way it goes? Like, hey, you either got to be present. Did Was he not present? What happens there? Did yeah, I, I, honestly, I cannot speak for him. I, I was on uh, the road with him and the Davison Brothers band, uh, Davison Brothers band from West Virginia and Channing Wilson. We were actually out hanging out on this bus and I think, Tyler did a show there and then we went back to this little bar somewhere in the holler in West Virginia and had a big old time till wee hours of the morning. But we kind of just talked music and, and shot the shit. And and after that, it's like you, you just you, you'd see him release a song and then it, it not work. And no one knows. I mean, it could be a relationship. It's all relationship. It could have been with like whoever his boss was at Sony at the time. It could have been maybe the song wasn't there or whatever. I mean, people people are willing to say like different things about different people. When somebody's hot, like they think that right now Luke Combs could just put out a turd song um, and it could go number one. But the thing is, he's not putting out turd songs either. You know, he's, he's, he's a, uh, he knows what his audience wants to hear. And it's just a weird, weird game. It's hard to put your finger on like why certain stuff works and why certain stuff doesn't. I know that uh, Tyler has some diehard fans. And I think that, uh, if he gets a little love, gets another one in the top 30, top 20, and then even another hit, he's right back there. He could still tour for the rest of his life, too. He has he has fans that are like, they they want Tyler Farr, and he's a relatable guy. He's a crazy bastard, but he's definitely a relatable guy. He's a good dude. Yeah, I love him. I think he's a great dude, too. So, so Revival pops up. Are you, are you still trying to 
make it as an artist or have you kind of let that part of the dream go Rob Snyder and you're just like you're building your revival brand and business and being a top songwriter at the same time or are you still out picking and hoping that you can get a record deal or how's that working in your mind for me uh I have no interest in any record deal I have an admin record deal right now through Empire um I'm putting out a full record on June the 12th I believe and it's just a songwriter record. It's a rock and roll record. And, you know, it was just something very therapeutic for me to do where songs that wouldn't get cut by other people. I went in there with a producer, uh, Oren Thornton, who's a great guy, also plays with Brent sometimes. And he just whittled down a list of about 60 songs. He goes, let's just tell your story, man. And let's just let's do unapologetically Rob Snyder uh, songs. And it was such a good process for me. I'm so glad I did it. We released two songs already. We have another one coming out May 8th called Jersey. I mean, not a lot of people in Nashville are going to cut a song called Jersey, you know, and that's, no, that's, that's where that's, that's the beach town where I grew up, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's just. Didn't Bon yeah. Jovi have an album called Jersey or New Jersey or so, Jersey something? Uh, I know. I don't know about Bon Jovi. I know uh, Springsteen had greetings from Asbury Park. I thought Bon Jovi had an album. So this album that you have that it's coming in June is all rock. It's a, it's like a songwriter kind of rock record. Um, it's, it's kind of all over the place. 10 tracks. Um, are any of them country rock, like country yeah. roots, country Absolutely. roots? Absolutely. I mean, I got one that is featuring Channing Wilson on it and we kind of, we ripped off the, uh, the Hank Jr. and Waylon, uh, video for the conversation. And we just set up in this little dive bar called the players Inn, about five minutes from my house in Nashville. And, uh, we kind of just dressed the part and, that stole all the little scenes with the boots clapping and, you know, drank 350 beers and drinking on a bottle of Jim Beam and had a blast doing it just for fun. Um, and then the title track, the way that I am, I actually uh, did an animated music video for. So just, uh, you know, I don't, I don't ever want to be like the artist artist. I, I don't think I could handle it just with my like anxiety issues that I have and stuff like that. And just how you have to always smile and always be on if I'm not having a good day you can see it on my face and just to have to smile and shake hands with everybody all the time. I'd be like, that would drive me crazy. And I'm a homebody. I want to be home. You know, it's like these guys work so hard. I bet you a lot of these country stars that are out there doing their thing right now that are not doing their thing right now because of quarantine, they're probably loving life because they get to be with their family for the first time in forever. I mean, Luke's gone for a month at a time. That's a lot. And I can't say that I ever want to do that, but I definitely love writing songs and doing doing my own thing. Would I love to have my song picked up and put in a TV show or a movie? Hell yeah. Like that would make me pumped. But like I got asked to do a couple hometown shows. I'm like, eh, I'm not really into it. Cause if I do it, I want to do it right. I want to have a band that means higher guns. It's going to cost a ton of money, but will I go play at a, uh, my favorite little spot in Westchester PA every time I'm home called saloon 151. Absolutely. Every single time. And I'll have about four openers, all local guys, and then I'll play for 30 minutes. And 30 minute shows, like that's that's my sweet spot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I uh by the way, they did have an album called New Jersey. Bon Jovi did. Okay. Uh, uh uh we had I had John Party on here yesterday, and he was telling me that the downtime and working his land and he's on the tractor and the backhoe and he's he, but he is, he's missing the touring. You know, he had a big April planned and it's sure. al it's almost like, you know, like he, it was going to be a big year for a part, you know, the party. And, and he was kind of like, you know, what happens now? Do you, do you pick up right where you were? Is every, or are people going to forget what was going on in country music and how, what's the trickle down effect going to be of these audiences and being able to, to go to a concert? How long is that going to take until that part of our world is, you know, back to normal or will it ever be back to normal? I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't, there's a lot of unknown. And so it was interesting here in his point of view of, of the quarantine and that he is taking advantage of it and he's writing and he's doing these sure. zoom rights and Facebook rights or FaceTime. I mean, but yeah, he's, you know, there's some worry, I think in a lot of people of like, well, what's, what's going to happen. You have to, I mean, like just everyone's been binging on TV and watching movies. It's like, I'm, I, I look at it from, I'm a pessimist. So it's like, I look at these TV shows and I'm, and I see somebody hug a stranger and I'm like, that never happened. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't mean shit now because that's not going to happen. And it's like, Chad, let me ask you this. If you went out to a concert, if they said Jamie Johnson was playing tomorrow in front of 20,000 people and I would go 
shoulder to shoulder with everybody and you have a family, you have people you got to take care of, you have mouths to feed, would you go out there? No. No. So, I mean, everything has changed. I wouldn't even consider it. And that's sad. That's like, and and, that. and, and, and if people would, they're crazy. If I, I think that, I think that you have to, and I know there's conspiracy theories and all that Rob, but it's like, Hey, you got grandparents, you got people over 65, you got people preexisting conditions and medical conditions. You got to look out for them and you yeah. don't want to go bring in that stuff. So is it real? How bad is it still? It does. It's, it's there. It's we're, we're here. We're six, seven weeks into this quarantine and I don't see a whole lot changing right now. I mean, I know there's trying to, they opened up Georgia a little bit, but if you yep. read the small print of what that opening means, it's a lot, it's not open. It's not yep. by any means. No, open. I mean, it's all two week phases. We're not far behind. I think on Friday, like Tennessee's Nashville's opening up. But I mean, even when gyms open up, they're looking around May 29th to open up gyms, but even then they have to be at half capacity you can't go into the locker rooms. You can't use the saunas. You have to wear a mask when, you know, it's like, this isn't living like that. And you know, having a waiter come up and take your order with a mask on and gloves. That's, that's yeah, crazy. Imagine a waiter touching my plate. I'd be like, get the hell out of here. I'm yeah. Here. It's like, nobody's going to do that. No. I, I don't know. I, so revival, when does this come about? What does the word mean to you when you name this brand? Because to me, it's kind of like, there's got to be a country music. I think Eric didn't church have it. No, he had country music. Jesus. There's yeah, country music. yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know what? I, I worked when I first moved to town, I got a job cause I broke up a fight at winners or at losers and Herb Woolsey gave me a job. He goes, get that guy a job. And I'm, and I was happy. Cause I mean, I moved to town with absolutely nothing. And I would play on Broadway acoustic sets during the day and then work the door at winners and losers at night to make my money, to help pay my rent, all that stuff. And then I started working whiskey jam every Monday night. And I loved whiskey jam because it was like a great thing where it was like, these people would go up, play three songs. It would be a great way for me to meet people. I didn't even tell anyone I was a songwriter the first year I was in town. I was just watching, seeing who's who, checking everything out. Now it's like people move to town and they're like, Hey, I'm this. And my buddy's this guy from Georgia. And I have this hookup and then they have a record deal and it's like, boom. And then they're gone the next week. You know, it's just like, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy thing. But um, for me, I actually got the idea of revival. And I tell this to Ward at whiskey jam all the time, you know, there wouldn't be a revival without whiskey jam because my thing was, I was like, wow, these people are playing such great songs, but it's also a very social aspect where people are not may, maybe not paying attention so much. So I was like, I want to do my own version. We got a church pew. I started it with a guy named Cody Walden, who no longer does it with me anymore. Um, but he, uh, we, we got a church pew. We set it up at Tin Roof. We did it on Tuesday nights, obviously not to compete with Whiskey Jam. And plus I was the door guy, so I had to work. And uh, the first one ever was like Eric Dillon, Channing Wilson, Leith Lofton, uh, Brent Cobb. And it was great. And it just kind of caught on from there. And we just made it clear that, you know, our slogan was kind of not so much the Hank and Jesus are watching, but let your songs do the talking. And it was just like an even playground where we'd have newcomers and then we'd have legends come in. I mean, for me to have Kim Williams come in and play the song that made me move to Nashville, which was three wooden crosses, just like a year later, blew my mind. And it opened the door as me for me as a, as a co-writer too, because I had these bigger writers coming to me saying, Hey man, uh, I want to play revival. Well, me being a, in my, the Rob Snyder business of a songwriter, I'm like, absolutely. Hey, also, do you want to write sometime? And I know that I'm not entitled, so they could easily say no, but when they do, then it's like, okay, they have a right with me. Sure. Some cancel, but when, when someone gave me a shot, I would make sure I have something started, have 50 different titles we could write and just be prepared. And I went to work and like that really helped launch my songwriting career as well. And so Revival is still at Tin Roof? It's still at Tin Roof. We have not had it since uh, March 10th, I believe, because we had to cancel the St. Paddy's Day show. And that's when I was in Vegas, actually, coming back from my cousin uh, Andrew's uh, bachelor party. And we got back on the 15th. And that was when it was a weird, weird time. And we were out at a bar in Vegas. And like I knew I didn't feel comfortable being there because we're the only people there. And then all of a sudden um, we get back and it's just, you know, nothing, everything's shutting down. And uh, been, we not had a revival since, I believe it was the 10th, but uh, we, I've been doing just little short ones every Tuesday just to, you know, try to have a couple of people on there and just try to spread the word. But, you know, it's, it's weird. It's a weird, weird 
times, unprecedented times for sure. Oh man, it's it's almost like too many conversations centered around it. It's hard not to go there. You try yeah. to stay optimistic. You've already yourself admittingly a pessimist. So you're like, you're <laughs> looking at it negative. I'm trying to be like, man, I, I just want the businesses to be able to create some revenue somehow. So yeah. we, so we don't lose a lot of our community leaders. And a lot of that, that that's the thing that affects me is that I can stay home, you know, that, but a lot of people can't without losing their job. And it's easy to take that for granted. So try to do our part and try to figure out how we can give back, you, you know, especially after this is over, how we can go to the front first responders and the front line and say, yeah. let us cook for you. Let us get you some wild game dinners. Go, you know, we got all these ideas and I'm like, shit, I thought we were gonna be able to do that in May. And now here we are coming up on May. And it's like our governor just said, we're not even at ground one or stage one of reopening yet. We're still ground zero and it pissed everybody off. So Wow. All sorts, all sorts of crazy, crazy things. So get besides her singing th- the, the Randy Travis, which is a whole other story and what happened with his life, which is crazy. I saw him on that show on A&E, the, 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 uh, live PD. Okay. Yeah. They had the Randy Travis night on there. They showed it and it's just like, he's a normal citizen. And they had all the police video of that night on the highway and him in the police car and oh, all wow. of it. And I'm like, they're really showing Randy Travis. Like there's there, they don't hold, they don't care who you are. If you get in trouble, I guess it becomes public domain. But besides that, hearing that, give me some other awesome, what, what stands out in your mind? Like, is there any other experiences where you're like, man, this is really happening on a Tuesday night in Nashville? I mean, Randy Travis was there. We did a Toys for Tots. I had my 87-year-old grandmother with us. um, And Randy Travis and her just taking pictures together. It's like we've had so many things. Drake White has done this one anniversary where his drummer at the time brought a suitcase and a kick pedal. And, like, I mean, you know, Drake has the ability to be hanging from the rafters and doing one-arm push-ups and stuff. But, like, we have a room that might fill – you know, 200 people and there's like 600 people in the tin roof to stuff. And it was a revival, like a legit revival. We've had so many people play Ronnie Bowman, who's wrote a bunch of the Chris Stapleton heads. who's incredible. Um, the list goes on and on and on. We have Miranda Lambert's been up there. You know, it's like, we have guys like Adam hood and Brent and Channing drop by regularly. Uh, Eric Dillon, great songwriter, the big guy, Luke Combs included us Channing and myself in the, she got the best of me video. We're sitting on the church pew. You know, like he he did it right. He showed his his up upbringing, like how it, how it happened in Nashville for him, and included us for it. I'll never forget when he gave me the call. He goes, "Hey, dude, I'm gonna have you guys in the video." And from that day, I was in the sauna twice a day, working out like five times a day. I was like, "If I'm gonna be on something with 110 million views, I gotta lose 20 pounds quick." <laughs> <laughs> so I, that- just, I strategically placed myself in between Channing and Luke, so I looked even skinnier. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that. Um, no, that's not the one I remember. There was one that was filmed at the Silver Dollar. I think it was Cole Swindell had filmed one of the bar there too with with Bobby Johnson. Um, oh, Bobby. Yeah, he gave me my first. That's who I was playing. I was playing at Bootleggers for Bobby. Oh, I love Bobby and Barrett. Yeah. I love Barrett Hobbs too. Uh, yeah, he's the he's the owner, right? Yeah. Yep. I love Barrett. The scoreboard, <clears throat> the scoreboard was the other place I used to play out there for him. Oh, yeah, right next to the Palace? Yep. Yeah. They, but they got that. They got some good shows going on there before the quarantine. They had some good things going on. They yeah. were doing. They had. They were doing that Daryl Singletary deal there every year. Yep. The the tribute to Daryl, which is another sad deal. He was a hell, hell of a country hell of a, singer. Hell of a singer. Unbelievable. So what's next? I mean, what is going on as far as revival goes? Are you are you selling merch? Are you are you booking shows right now? Or is everything just up in the air right at the tin roof right now? There's no clue when you're going to be able to have another one. No shows. Um, we are doing, we're going to start doing, we're doing a revival live from my buddy has a really cool ranch in Seymour, Texas, um, which is uh, about three hours northwest of Dallas. And uh, th- I'm going to have a couple guys that are out there quarantining together. Um, and they're going to do a Facebook live revival thing. And then after that, I'm just going to be keep doing the Instagram things, try to keep some people happy and keep people, people keep it short, keep people engaged. And uh, merch, I do have some really cool hats coming in, that kind of stuff, some new stuff that I'll have up on the store, which is just revival615. Like this one? Is it as cool as this one? Yep. Got that one. Look at that, people. That's a badass lid right there. Well, and and, and from there, it's just, you know, our anniversary show was slotted to be May 12th, I think. And I don't think 
You know, I don't think our it's seven years, so I, I don't think we're going to have it. Who knows? Maybe we'll have our eighth, seventh and eighth year anniversary at the same show or or if they, you know, say October comes around and they say we can do it. Damn it. We're going to do it then. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to it. It's just I want people to feel comfortable and, you know, I want I want the artists to feel comfortable. I want everyone to feel comfortable. And like it's just going to take us some time to get back there. Did you have any big guests slated for the anniversary show in May? Um, who did I have? I think just like the normals. We always try to have Adam, Hood, Leith, uh, Brent. You know, Luke is at the point now where if he would do it, like we can't put his name on the poster because it will just be like Nashville shows up to Tin Roof and like no one can even move. Yeah. So um, maybe a Riley Green sneak in there, like guys like that. You know, we'll 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 definitely uh we'll do it at some point. I I I just deleted my calendar from mid-March through um, end of May just because I've just deleted who was on there and I'm just doing new things on the Instagram live thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's freaking crazy. It is it's freaking crazy, man. Why don't you sing one? You got a guitar right there? Sure. Do you feel like it? Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Just sing us one of yours. Please, one of mine. sir. All right. So you wrote this, or is this on the album, or what? What are we hearing? Uh, I guess I should play one off the. You know, I'm just gonna play a newer one that's not even on my album. All right, that's all right. It's called "What Color Is Happy." What color is happy? Lonely is blue. What makes us hungry? Broken and bruised. How come the hard times always hang on you? What color is happy if lonely is blue? Damn this old sunshine. My girl, it's been a long, long time, and I'm still hurt. Yeah, I'm still hurt. I feel like a prisoner, shackled and chained, living on sand tanks for the rest of my days. There ain't no freedom when it comes to what color is happy if long is blue. Damn this old sunshine creeping through my curtain. It's been a long like that dude i'm for real I, like when you say damn that sunshine creeping through my curtain are you pissed off because you have to face another day is that the mind of the songwriter yeah it's kind of like pissed off that you have to face a the other another day without whatever you don't have you know so is this is this a breakup song 
you're married. How do you still write these kind of songs when you're, you're so happy in love and it's almost like you're a man that's broken because she's gone and you're in a dark place and you don't want to see the light of day because all that does is make you feel lonely or that life's going on and you really don't have a life anymore because she's gone or can it be anything and not just a girl in a broken it's heart? not just a girl, but I always, you know, songs, it always does better when it's about a girl for sure. Uh, for me, it's, you know, an anxiety issue that I've had since I was, you know 18 19 years old it's uh you know it's just it's life experiences seeing somebody in a bad relationship and put yourself in their position it's just having again it's having your antenna up and and seeing you know if it was a fight your your mom and dad got in one time or your aunt and uncle or you know your friend in college or whatever it's just you know it's personal experiences you you, you keep all these little vignettes in your head and then you get on a song and you know, that day I wrote that song, I didn't even want to write that song. Someone came in with this title. It was just like, I was like, oh, I don't even know who this person is. And that was just one of those things. I was in the driver's seat. They said the title, What Color is Happy? And I just spewed it out in 25 minutes and, and we were done. And then I went back listening to their songs. I'm like, God, that's one of my favorite songs that I've done in the past year. <laughs> What color so, is happy? I like that, man. Yeah, so that'll be on the next one whenever I get around to doing that. Have you ever heard a song called The Bridge? Uh, a bridge too wet to burn no i have not that song that you just sang the melody now i'm figuring out you know what i do know what a melody is but it sounds like bobby johnson's has a song about crying so much walking home and that you can't really burn that bridge because it's too wet you know he cried so much he's he's a sleeper he's got some great songs i've I tell him every day, like, dude, I've been telling him forever. I've been telling him. I remember like he had us playing this thing for little kids at like 9 a.m. There was like these kids from Chattanooga High School or or something came in and we had to play him songs. He played Sour Mash Rainbow. Oh, I love that song. He's dude. Great. I, I tip my hat to Bobby Johnson. You know, he's he does whatever he does to, to pay the bills. And I know he's always chasing deer and doing something like that. But I mean, songwriter should not be off the list of things he's good at because he's a great songwriter. That's that sour mash song and passing the bottle and and mm-hmm. then the 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 bridge too wet to burn. It's like that theme right there. That's a good song, dude. I like that whole you, sun Thanks. coming through the curtain and you're still hurting. Like we all live that. That's just so real and raw and again. And it's sh- a little like abstract too. It's like where the listener can kind of take it and, and make yeah, it. That's what I'm doing. I'm just sitting here like not speechless, but kind of like, well, he kind of left me. I don't, I still don't know what color happy is and oh, yeah. it's for me to find out. Right. It's like, where exactly. is your happy? Like there's so many different levels of happy. What makes you happy? Like I have everything in the world, right? Like yeah. I have, I, I can't, I can't imagine having a better life and I'm not worth a million dollars. I'm not anything. And it's just that right. I love what I've been able to do in life, but I still wake up with that feeling like, damn it, son, go back down. You know, like I ain't ready to, I ain't ready to fade. And it's just a, I think that that's what music's supposed to do to you. I think that songwriters are so important to the culture of the history of our country, because I don't know how many people have gotten through on she looks so good in love or, you know, my baby saying goodbye. like Dean Dillon wrote stuff that, that steal, like I was brought up on. And then when you hear like Patsy Cline do crazy that my dad was brought up on and, yeah. and what songwriting is meant for so freaking long and the words and the lyrics, dude, it's like, man, it's just so important to what we, what we do. Well, I mean, and that's the thing. It's like, again, going back to the area of the country where I'm from, I mean, guy right in our backyard was Jim Croce. I mean, that that's a guy that just blows your mind on the songs. And then you get like understudies of him where you get like Bruce Springsteen, who was right there. And it's just like blows your mind on like how they can get into the pain of a guy that is not happy to be home or a factory worker or just, a you know, a steel mill worker or something like that. And like get the American like the angst in there. It's like where they put out, you know, born in the USA. And people thought it was like this. Yay, American song. But it wasn't, you know, yeah. it was like. It was the trials and tribulations of people that are not getting the love from their own country they fought and died for. So it's crazy. It's crazy. Songwriting is a, it's a weird thing, but I agree. It is very important. And without music, man, it's just, I would, I would have gone insane years ago for sure. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. It's gotten me. I, I don't do ever since, 
ever since like Kevin DeBrow saying, come on, feel the noise. And then I went to my first concert and Twisted Sister opened up for Iron Maiden. By the way, Rob, <laughs> my dad made me leave when the mummy came out and they started singing 666 is the number of the beast. My dad's like, we're out here. He let me stay through Twisted Sister though. And, and D Snyder said the F word, every other word on stage. But he never did that on like the Stay Hungry album or Come Out and Play album. It was live. D Snyder's like, F this and F that. And my dad's like, what are we doing here? But he yeah. stuck it, he stuck it through, but then Iron Man, he's, but man, like Rodney James Dio and Holy Diver and Last in Line and all the stuff. Like I go back and read those lyrics and I'm just like, man, in 1983, when I was listening to that stuff, it didn't mean anything compared to what it means now to me. And like born in the USA is the same way. That was, that was kind of like, you know, little pink houses or Jack and Diane. And you go yeah. back and you're like, what is he really saying? here it's like it's and everybody has their own interpretation it's 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 one of those deals to where you just you, you hear a song and if it hits you the right way that's what like forms an opinion of that song and it sticks with you and if i took you like through a little tour of my studios and stuff you would see like the songs that I grew up on, like the Don Williams album is that I, I got all my dad's vinyls and, and my dad passed away. And, but I, I went over and snuck a few vinyls out of mom's deal of, of, of what I feel shaped my life, you know? And, yeah. and, and I see, I got run DMC, Peter Piper and raising hell. I got beastie boys from when I was in sixth grade and listen oh, yeah. to Paul Revere every day. And, and I have Metallica master of puppets before they sold out with the black album, which I know that's an opinionated statement. Sorry, Rob, but it's like, it's like I have those up on my wall not to be like, oh, it's just an album. No, those are the, that's the, what shaped my life. And then in this room is like all the movie posters that shape my, you know, from the Sopranos to this, to that. And, and it's just kind of like what I was brought up on, you know, yeah. like a, there's a Bo Jackson poster. There's an Axl Rose poster. There's a Tony Soprano poster. Right. And it's just kind of like all the stages I went through that, 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 that I think everybody was. had a Bo Jackson face. Everybody. And they should have if they didn't. Yeah. I think if you're, if you're 35 and under, you you had a Bo Jackson face, and at least had the poster where you had the shoulder pads and the and the baseball, the the, the baseball yeah, bat. I got it. Pad. I got it in there, and I was going over these baseball cards the other night with with these with a thirteen year old, and I was showing him Bo with you know the shoulder pads on. It's eighty eight Fleer when eighty eight Fleer put that set out, and I I got like I don't even know how many of them, and I'm he's like looking at me and I'm like, you can have one. And he's like, no way. Cause you can't get a Bo Jackson card anymore. You know, unless you like really go seek it out. And, and I think Bo's great. He hunts, he fishes, he's got a great charity. Um, but yeah, like it just music shaped my life, dude. It does. Yeah. And, and that's why I am. So what, whether I ever get somebody to listen to me, like all I know is that what I see and what I see is the same exact consistency across the board that when I play a Haley Witter song and then a Brent Cobb song and a Rob Snyder song and a Channing Wilson song and an Adam Hood song and a Kyle Daniel song and a Paul McDonald song and I play that shit and when people hear Paul McDonald and my brother's like, who the hell's this? Is this Jack White? And I'm like, no, that's this dude named Paul McDonald. That song's called called Wild Card. And he's like, this is freaking awesome, right? And yeah. that, I'm like, nobody knows who this dude is. Nobody right. knows who he is. And I'm like, so it's if gone. It's gone. It's, it's got, and if I ever have one little iota of a piece of pride of being able to say, dude, we didn't discover Drake White and we didn't discover Leith Loft or any of these guys. We just believed in them because their songs hit me. When I hear their shit, it's different. It's it, it makes me feel like when I listen to a Don Williams song. Like sure. that, like when I hear Don Williams sing about Wolfman Wolfman and laying in his bed, that was me. A little radio up against my head, listen to the top nine at nine, or I would sneak out and watch Friday night videos to see if Rat and Out of the Cellar and Stephen Piercy was jamming and Judas Priest and Rob Halford was there, and I'd be like, dude, this is live. I never ever could learn how to play an instrument. And to this day, I keep threatening. I'm like, mom, I'm gonna be a professional drummer someday. I am, I I'd go to lessons with this guy named the Boogeyman and I can hit him, you know? But now I watch like comedians like Bill Burr and they're like jamming. And like, I know people that can just hit the skins and music is so important to me. I never took it to that level. Just like, right. ro just like rodeo is important to me and bull riding, but I never have wore a pair of Wranglers, right? It's just, I have respect for all these segments of life. And I, I, I just growing up, I would do anything to listen to music and go yeah. to a live show. My first country live show was Tanya Tucker and freaking, uh, Oh, Sawyer Brown at Marriott's resort in California. And I got to see Sawyer Brown rock it. And I'm like, dude, these guys are bad. Ah. And Tanya, like she's genius. And like, she just had that album last year, whatever and did what it did. But I, I don't know, man, I could talk about music with you every day and hopefully people will hear this and people will say, well, I want that music. 
I yeah. like that. What, who, who's that? I'm like, that's Rob Snyder. Who's that song? What's that song that you were playing the other day? And I'm like, oh, that, that was Ain't a Road Too Long. And they're like, dude, that song yeah. has got me, man, about my, my family's last name and there ain't a load too heavy and all this shit. Like, that's genius songwriting to me. There's a song on Brent Cobb's Providence album. You probably helped him write it, but it's the one about, about too many jacked up trucks in the way and freaking, and, uh, and, and, and the way Nashville is, he's just waiting his turn kind of. Do you know the song I'm talking about? Yeah, I did not help him write it, but I think it's when the dust settles. Yes, when the dust settles. Like I'm sitting there, I was on a boat at Donner Lake in Northern California, Rob, and I'm listening to that, and I'm like, he's he's talking about Nashville, and he's it's like when shit. and he's talking shit, but he's, he's making you he's he's making you believe it, and you're bobbing your head to it the whole yeah, time. Yeah, and I'm like I'm like that's what he was chicken dancing to when he opened for Stapleton when I saw him at Lake Tahoe, and he's like, when the dust settles, like when he's saying is when the dust settles, the real songs are gonna fuck are gonna. I just cussed. I shouldn't cuss. I have a <laughs> lot of kids that listen to this. The real songs are gonna be here, and I'm like, dude, that's a genius way of saying it. Yeah. It's just like the, the the dirt road is just a little bit too skinny right now, but when the dust settles, y'all, just yeah. like what you just said about Bobby Johnson, like it ain't too late, like Leith Lofton, his time's coming. Yeah. That's, oh, I love the last song on Leith's record, uh, with the Don't Let the World Win. Wow, that was awesome. So good. Well, that song you just did, you got another one? Let's end it on another Rob sure. Snyder. Rob, thank you for being on this. Let's, let's do it again. I love everybody check out what's the website, Rob? Uh, website is robsnydermusic.com and then all the revival stuff is at revival615.com revival615 the area code of that part of Tennessee and Nashville I'm wearing a hat that you can see right here I love it I have uh, there's other ones that I have already been wearing this week people love them he's got new hats coming so check out the merch at revival615.com you can find him at Instagram at revival615 too yeah, revival615.com. And then what's the Instagram? At revival615. At revival615. And support. I, I, I can't make it more, more, you know, more clear. Like this music is what is going to save us when it comes to life, not the lifeblood that we breathe. But I'm telling you that just listen to the lyrics and attach yourself to what the songwriters we talked about are saying, get their records, support them, get their merch. I just went on to Adam Hood's merch and I bought every shirt that he makes. One, they're cool. They look awesome. They're comfortable. They have a good message. He's a great human being. His right. wife's a great human being. And I want to support these guys that are giving me the substance that I listen to every day that gives me the confidence to move forward with trying to grow a brand or take my daughter to the mountains and shoot a gun. They sing about America. They sing about life. They sing about what we go through on a daily basis. And so did Merle and so did Willie and so did Waylon and so did Christofferson and so did Johnny. But you know what? That music has been, these guys have passed the torch to the, the singers and songwriters that I'm talking about right now. And Rob Snyder is one of them. So I give him kudos what he does and the platform he's giving so many singer songwriters to do at Tin Roof every Tuesday night in Nashville with the Revival. So please support Revival, support Whiskey Jam. Ward is a great dude. We support Whiskey Jam. I've been to Whiskey Jam. I've seen awesome stuff happen at Whiskey Jam on Monday nights in Nashville and Midtown. And I support them too. So just get on, get on it and get this music and just watch. You're going to be like, man, I remember that dude when I saw him at revival and then he's going <laughs> to, he's going to be huge. And you're going to be like, I was part of that. And that's what Rob and these guys are doing. So support revival six, one, five, Rob Snyder. Thank you so much. Any closing words, brother? Thank you, brother. I just, Hey man, I tip my hat off to you because you are, you know, you're, you're helping getting the, the platform. You're just making the platform even bigger and, and just seeing your love for this kind of music and, and for the people that are, you know, behind the scenes in the music just inspires me. It makes me want to go to work even, even harder. So I appreciate you, bud. And I really appreciate you having me on. Well, man, I'd love to, I can't wait to have you back. I can't wait until I get to see, see a revival and congratulations on the song coming out by Luke Combs, six feet away, written by Rob Snyder, Brent Cobb and Luke Combs himself. And I'm, I, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that it climbs the charts. I have an, I, I have a good feeling that it's going to, um, yeah. 
and 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 get Rob Snyder's music. You can find it at robsnydermusic.com. We're going to leave you today instead of our theme song that we go in and out of every episode with that song called Money All Gone by Drake White and Leith Lofton with Leith singing it. We're going to leave you with this Rob Snyder original right here. This has been another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast. Thank you for supporting Jack Daniels. Thank you for supporting Revival 615 and all the partners and sponsors that take care of us on a daily basis. Take it away, Rob. Thank you all very much. Talk to you soon. Thank you, bud. This is the title track off my record coming out June 12th. It's called The Way That I Am. I would unbreak your heart and unlearn your name. And I'd never cause you one ounce of pain. I would walk through the door and look you in the eye. I'd finally come clean with all of my lies. I know I wouldn't be the way that I am if I could do it all over again. The lines on my face, they all know where I've been. Oh, if I could do it all over again. Oh, if I could do it all over again. Calling his number was easy to do. We were drunk on a Sunday in the middle of June. Hell, I even swore he looked all right to drive. And I still blame that call for taking his life. I know I wouldn't be the way that I am if I could do it all over again. The lines on my face, they all know where I've been. No, oh, if I could do it all over again. Oh, if I could do it all over again. And I have grown tired of the same old mistakes, but I wouldn't be where I am if I could do it all over. I know. Bye.